all right? I said, what are these people going in and out of here? Oh, we're booking horses in the back. I said, they don't bother you? He said, no, they just want to get Mickey. They called him Mickey Mouse, and his men, they called him the Seven Dwarfs. He ran a bookmaking operation in Los Angeles, and, of course, they figured, uh, the, the Italian mob figured that they, uh, they owned the concession. And Mickey was a former boxer, and he came from Cleveland. Now, they have some tough guys in Cleveland, and a guy named Polizzi was a sponsor for, uh, for Mickey. So that kind of kept the edge off of uh, the Los Angeles mob. Had to get permission to kill him, really. So they attempted it. There's a rumor around town that somebody posted a bounty on your head. Have you heard about this? No. Are you much, are you much concerned with it? No, too much. You know of anyone that uh, might uh, bury you in the ill will to the extent of placing a bounty on your head? I haven't seen one of the shows. I wouldn't understand why, why it would be worth anything for anybody to do it. I mean, Mickey Cohen was kind of a two-bit. He did not travel in the best of circles. He was short and dumpy and kind of bald-headed and um, a rather nondescript little man, except he had a very loud voice and he made a lot of noise. One of his men, uh, Stampanato, who was a, a street collector, a street thug, but a very handsome man. And, uh, and appealing because of his sort of a brute strength, and, but a very, very handsome man. And he started... He would meet a lot of turned restaurants around town in Beverly Hills where they all hung out at the well. And he got to know Alana Turner. My mother was someone who had most of her closest friends more among the crew. Uh, she was known as, and this is meant complimentary, but with the crew she was known as a good girl, a good old girl, a fun gal. Okay? She related. She was, my mother was never traveled in the, the top echelon, the snobby echelon, you know. She didn't. She liked to have a good time. And she liked to have people around her who had a good time. And then Stampanato, who just forced himself on her, just moved in with her. And then she put up with it and for whatever reason. And then, of course, then he got involved with the daughter, Cheryl. And the next thing we know, he's dead. I remember it very clearly, but it's almost today as if I'm watching a motion picture of myself. I have been able to remove, I think, the terrible fear and anguish and sorrow that I felt about that night. I think I've been able to come to terms with those emotions so that I can step back and look at it. Someone, we, we're not sure, and Cheryl was blamed for it, but we're not sure, someone, might have been Lana Turner, put a knife into uh, Stampanato and, uh, and broke his major, major artery, burst, and he died on the spot. I think the act that happened that night of picking up a knife and defending my mother and myself because I was as, as afraid for my life as I was for hers. I mean, he was hurting her physically. But from his words, I was next. A need to survive. But you must recall, in those days, the studios ran the town. All Lana Turner had to do was call her studio, and they would have had security people over there in 20 minutes rearranging the body, rearranging everything. So we never, nobody's ever really known only what Cheryl says, and she was in shock. They might have told her she did it, you see. She never truthfully, never has ever come out and been able to explain just how she did it. I did not see her one-on-one -on -one for a approximately, it wasn't quite a week, but it was maybe four or five days later because I was taken from the house to the police station to juvenile hall, and I was never allowed to be alone with her. And my 
recollection of the first time we were together, we put our arms around each other and hugged and cried, but we only talked about what was happening of the moment. And I think I was saying, get out of here. You know, that kind of a thing. There was no reference to what had happened. I want to be loved by you, just you. Nobody else but you. I want to be loved by you. The diddly 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 dum. Boop boop be doo. Uh, the story of Marilyn Monroe is really a tragic one because she obviously was a, a tremendous celebrity worldwide and she was really kind of cut down in the prime of life. But her early days in Hollywood um, began with relationships with the mob. You know, she was married to Joe DiMaggio. Well, could imagine, I don't know who her first husband was, but her second husband was Joe DiMaggio, who was the most uh, identified Italian at that time. And then she married Arthur Miller, who was a Pulitzer Award winner. Boy, you're really making different steps. And uh, it's just my opinion. She never found a real friend. As Marilyn's career moved steadily upward through influence from behind the scenes by the mob, she became obviously a tremendous star with Niagara and All About Eve. And at that time, uh, no one needed to help her career along. She had everything uh, uh, going for her. Uh, simultaneously, uh, the CIA saw an opportunity to use her. She was a type of woman who was malleable, who could be manipulated. Uh, she needed to feel needed. Um, which is amazing because she was so wanted by everybody. Imagine, you know, being alone in the room all by yourself. Because imagine if you walked down Broadway, it would be like an Eisenhower parade. And apparently she'd be despondent. I, I really don't think she had any really intention to, to uh, overdose herself in, in pills. I just think it was just she'd lost contact, you know, her whereabouts of what she was doing. They said, I found her to be a gracious gal. And now, uh, you add in the fact that she gets involved with Jack Kennedy. She gets involved in, with Robert Kennedy. And she has relations with the mob, as well as with the CIA. She becomes a very dangerous individual. When she said, I'm going to blow the lid off this entire thing, she was not referring just to her relationship with Robert Kennedy or Jack Kennedy, which would have been sensational. But it was really going to be, look at what our government has been doing behind the scenes. brothers had relationships with uh, the sex goddess of the 60s, Marilyn Monroe, and that uh, Jimmy Hoffa was trying to get evidence against the Kennedys and had a man um, by the name of Spindell recording uh, meetings between Marilyn Monroe and the Kennedy brothers, secretly recording because of an electronic bug put in the, the, the house. I just don't know what Marilyn Monroe was used for. Um, I tell you this, I do not believe for a second, not for a second, that the Kennedy brothers had anything to do with her death. I don't believe that for a second. As to whether the mafia clipped her or whether, I mean, I am under the impression now, as I was, I've always been under the impression, that this woman was very troubled and that she committed suicide. And I have seen no evidence, no evidence, to convince me of anything to the contrary. Now, they could have chosen any time they wanted to kill Marilyn Monroe. But why did they choose the very day, the very evening, that Bobby Kennedy was there? And that was the result of Sam Gentana's real motivation, was it was one thing to accept the contract and to, to kill Marilyn Monroe, but what he wanted to do was expose the relationship between Bobby and Marilyn. And it was a, a tremendous opportunity for him, given that Bobby was there that evening, uh, 
they helped sedate her because she was so obsessed that if they murdered her on that evening, it would almost look like Bobby Kennedy may have actually murdered her. As to her mob associations, that may well have been true. But I know that a lot of what's being represented right now is irresponsible disinformation, and to allege that the, that the Kennedy brothers had anything to do with her murder is just simply uh, untrue. She was sedated, and shortly before midnight, the assassin from Chicago got into the home, and uh, they had rubber gloves on. She was already sedated, so she was uh, she struggled, but was not in any position to to uh, uh, resist. They taped her mouth, put her on the bed. She was nude, and they forced a suppository, a specially doctored Membrotol suppository that included barbiturates and chlorohydrates. Uh, once they administered the suppository, it dissolved went right into the membrane, right into the bloodstream, and there was no way to save her, unlike putting pills down her throat, which could have bruised her face, uh, could have resulted in vomiting. Uh, it was the perfect way to kill Marilyn Monroe, because even if the medical team got to her, they could not save her because it was within her bloodstream. It was not in her stomach. And as a result, they were successful. And the Marilyn Monroe then was eliminated and was no longer a threat to the mob, to the, and to the CIA, as well as to the Kennedys. Bye-bye, baby. Remember, you're my baby. When they give you the eye. Well, it's, uh, it's been rumored for years that there has been a connection with MCA and the mob uh, prosecutors throughout the years have been trying to prove that uh, for indictment purposes and beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, we had conducted an investigation to try to determine if the mob was involved in some manner, shape, or form with MCA. There was a movie that De Laurentiis had done called The Brink Job, which was completely ba backed, financially backed by the, by the underworld. Um, there were a number of other situations that the De Laurentiis had been involved in uh, where organized crime was directly involved. I mean, this is not, this is not a new phenomenon to the De Laurentiis or to the motion picture industry as a whole. I mean, the mafia's penetration of Hollywood uh, has existed throughout the century, and it continues to this day. There was a wiretap affidavit uh, that was publicly disclosed sometime in 1989, I believe, uh, concerning one of the former top executives of MCA, Eugene Giaquinto. Uh, that wiretap affidavit seemed to indicate that Mr. Giaquinto had organized crime associations with one Edward Chandra, the underboss of the Buffalino family. To all intents and purposes, that investigation was killed by the Justice Department because of this incredible sweetheart relationship between Hollywood and the studios and the federal government of the United States. Basically, uh, prosecutors are not permitted to investigate these allegations of corruption within the motion picture industry when they involve, ma when they involve major motion picture studios, such as MCA. Specifically, the MCA investigation was killed by the Justice Department itself, leading to the, the firing of one honest prosecutor by the name of Marvin Rudnick and leading to the to the resignation and frustration of another honest prosecutor by the name of Richard Staben. It was revealed that there were two and possibly three uh, projects in various stages concerning the life of Mara Lansky. Uh, and it appeared that there were three different organized crime families that might have had some type of an interest in each project. Uh, they were the Gambino family from New York City and the Genovese family from New York City. And it, it appears, and again, historically it appears, that when one does a movie about the mob in America, that the mob usually in some manner participates in the movie. Uh, the problem is that there are 12 affidavits uh, spelling out these wiretaps, which were sealed by the court. Uh, one of the affidavits was leaked out somehow and fell into the hands of me and a, and a couple other people in the world of journalism. Uh, but the other 11 remain sealed. 
but we do know that those wiretaps include threats by the participants, the targets of the investigation,